Why, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 452. That's Cuatro Cinco Dos. Cuatro Cinco Dos. Cuatro Cinco Dos. Perdona. Hope you guys are doing well wherever you may be. It's me, your host, Agostino Zynga. If it's the first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash that like button. Click subscribe, turn on the notification bell, leave me a comment down below and give me a share. If you listen via the podcast app, a five-star review on your podcast application, specifically the Apple podcast, will help get this show up the ranking. So please, if you've got five minutes, put a little review in there for your boy and whatever else, you know, podcasting platform you're using. And of course, support via Patreon is more than welcome. You can sign up to my Patreon at patreon.com for just Agostino, for slash A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O to get one bonus episode per week, a minimum of one. It could be two, it could be three, it could be four, but you get a bonus episode of the Agostino Zinger Show, live and direct, raw content, real opinions, nothing PC, only on Patreon. So make sure you sign up to Patreon dot com for slash a g o s t i n h o don't delay you can sign up on there today for as little as one dollar the equivalent of one pound you get entry to all my bonus shows and obviously communication with me on there and some other perks so get involved on patreon.com for slash agostino patreon.com for just agostino link can be found in the description don't delay get involved today oh man how you doing i hope you're good wherever you may be I'm feeling mighty fine, as you can tell. Gym week number two in the bag. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling strong. The cardio and the weights is really working in conjunction. But now I'm going to start really upping the cardio and really going for it because, you know, the weight's not coming off quickly enough for me. I've lost about, what, five? No, fifth, no, 10 pounds, actually, in the last two weeks. But generally, I feel a little bit more... I feel stronger, but usually I feel a little bit more tighter, a little bit more sliv- uh, slivet and, you know, wafy when I've been running a lot more. And obviously with this gym, doing three times a week and having a, the other odd days doing a bit of running, I'm going to be looking amazing by the time the club's open in June. Because that's a plan. I want When the club's reopen in June, I just want to be topless in there, just, you know, flipping, throwing up shapes, completely sober. That's a plan too, actually. The first one back, I'm just going to be stone cold sober. I just want to go in, especially the first couple of weeks. Oh, no, the first couple of years. The first week, sir. Let me not lie to you. The first week, I want to be stone cold sober. I want to go in there and I want to remember every part of that night. Because I used to do that often. Often. Why am I speaking like that? I used to do that all the time. Whenever I used to go to Berlin, right? I, I, I've been to Berlin, what, every year since 2015. And I would go basically, you know, to go and obviously do a bit of techno tourism. And part of the remit of going was because, I, you know, I really want to be a part of this scene. I DJ myself. I put on my own club nights involved you know love fucking techno to death and every other genre that exists within the electronic slash dance music scene and i just want to go in and experience the whole thing because that's basically the the what the the highest tier of club culture that you can actually find right the piece de resistance probably only second to like london in terms of just artists and club nights i'm not going to say experience because i think there's a few other places like you know georgia popping up you know places like ukraine are doing really well places in, in russia in moscow are flipping popping so i'm not going to say the club scene is the best but i'm just being in terms of like overall you know range of djs clubs that you can go to you know obviously we've got a big history here in terms of electronic music blah 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 so i do that every year and part of my ritual would be like the first week or the, sorry, the first couple of days that I'd land in Berlin, I'd kind of just be like, you know, just absorbing everything, absorbing it in, just kind of taking it all in with nothing, with nothing in my body, um, no drinking, no class A substances, nothing. Just kind of, I want to take it all in and remember it. Because as the days and weeks go on, especially if I step into the Bergheim, you know, the days, months go by, especially the old, the old Grease Mule 2 would be a great spot to just like unwind and just be there from like, you know, Saturday all the way until flipping Sunday morning. Um, you go to about blank and that'll be flipping amazing. Like you just go to so many different places. Um, you'd even go to that, my favorite bar actually in Berlin called Roses, which I think hopefully is still around. Um, one of my favorite bars there. It's all kind of um in clandestine bar covered in mirror. Well, the front of it looks like a bit like a like a pawn shop, like a brothel, and the inside is covered in velvet red sort of like pile all over the all over the side of the walls. And then there's loads of weird little mannequins hanging off from the roof. You know, those kind of standard kitschy bars that you find in Berlin. So that's always a great thing. But yeah, I just loved 
being able to anchor myself without anything, without any drugs or any, any alcohol for the first couple of days, just to kind of absorb and kind of really remember everything tactically or tac- uh, just kind of have a tactile experience, tactically, tactile experience. Same goes for when we start clubbing here. So the plan is work out really hard, run a lot, eat really well. And then when the clubs reopen, you know, top off, middle of the dance floor, just dance it like I'm on it when I'm not. It's going to be an absolute session. So it's going to be an absolute session and a half. I cannot wait. Everyone's going to be sessioning it. Everyone's going to be sessioning it. Actually sessioning it. Everyone's going to be sessioning in the UK on that day. June 21st is going to be an absolute melter of an occasion. So I cannot wait going forward. That whole week is going to be mad. So maybe maybe for that Monday to Wednesday, I'll probably just go boom, boom, boom. Just want to just be in a room. I mean, because the last time I heard actual music loud in a... In, in, in closed space was like when I go to Pirate Studios and do DJ mixes oh yeah talking about Pirate Studios so the plan is going forward because obviously clubs are going to be reopening in what a couple of months still so still some time to go I was thinking even though I'm not really a big fan of it I'm going to start doing some live stream DJ sets obviously you guys know that you know I DJ also in my spare time and I've kind of been taking that a little bit more seriously over the last few years obviously COVID said see you later you got dreams bye yeah <laughs> a little bit kind of stopping it but i was doing it quite often before that you know djing for the most part what thursday to saturday every weekend or every other weekend which was great it really kind of upped my levels and got me to a really good standard very quickly even though i thought i was pretty decent before um still being able to play in front of people and actually practice in real life is is the best ever and again it sharpens your tools it makes you want to crate dig a lot more blah 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 but obviously that's been put on hold and I've not really been a fan of the live stream thing. I've done a few myself. I've recorded them, then I've uploaded them. But the actual element of actually doing them live is actually what makes it interesting and what actually adds the actual live element like you're somewhere doing it. It's not the same because it's just streaming it online to, you know, I'm not really looking at anybody when I'm playing. I'm just in an enclosed studio sort of streaming it off my laptop and stuff. But I'm definitely going to do it going forward. So look out for DJ live streams for myself, obviously in the test mix series. So if you're watching this via YouTube, you would have seen a couple of my texts. Test test mixes on my channel and if you're listening via the podcast you definitely can hear those too i'll link in my soundcloud in the show notes description so check those out test mix i've got a whole series where i just kind of go through a few stuff that i'm into i'll kind of give you an idea the kind of stuff that i play and you know kind of go through the range of music that i like and you know i'm not really somebody that kind of caters to genres to be completely honest i play anything from disco to techno um anything that really sounds good and that vibes me at a time i kind of put together in a set and then you know keep the party rocking so look out for those live dj sets coming to you very very soon um i'm going to be doing a few more of those as obviously i just kind of came to a realization i was like you know what clubs aren't gonna be open for a while i might as well just start doing um you know what you call it live mixes again and kind of putting them out on youtube and you know doing it that way and sharing a bit of the stuff that i do outside of podcasting so though look out for that look out for that Anyway, jam pack show for you today. Let's get on in it. Let's get involved. Um, what can I talk about you about? Oh, you know what I wanted to talk about? Have you guys heard Slime Language too? I'm just, especially the Deluxe Cut album came out. Let me just, let me stop. I'm getting too excited. Young Fug has his, you know, little label, YSL, right? Young Stone Alive, where he's got you know his artists on there. I think his first might have been Gunner. I'm I'm sh- I'm not too sure, but basically he put this compilation album together first time round called Slime Language, and now he's got a second one called Slime Language Two, and it's bad. It's so good, bad as in great. It's amazing. He's got so many unexpected um collabs there and features that you wouldn't have really expected, especially on the deluxe. Who would have thought you would ever hear Jim Jones uh, rapping alongside some of the guys on, um, you know, on Young Stoner Life. That was pretty great. But still, my most kind of favorited artist from that whole kind of crew click Atlanta QC scene has to be Gunner and Lil Baby, of course. Right, Lil Baby's got a track on there. I think it might be track four or something that he just skates on. But there's this track here called Explosion, right? And Gunner on the chorus, like... This sounds like a Mayan chant or something, right? You could you could sack a city if you heard this. Listen to this. Honestly, you could you could sack a city if you heard that. Sack a city. And it wouldn't even be fair. And throughout the entire thing, this guy just skates on it, right? It's called Explosion. It's on the deluxe version of it. Eight new songs added to it. There's a The Baby feature, which is pretty sick. There's a, um, what, who else featured? There's a Don Tolliver feature, which is insane. Nav. You've got some kid called Migo. 
who is flipping as uh, amazing. I think his kids might be like under 15. You've got the Jim Jones, of course, like really, really good um, compilation. He's got so many people on there, like random people that you probably haven't heard of who are loosely affiliated. Like you can, you can't, you can't really ever say Young Thug doesn't put on for his friends. Like if you're a friend and he vibes with you, he is going to make sure that you get onto his album that you get onto his mixtape, that you get onto his EP. He definitely, he definitely kind of reaches back and kind of brings his prejudice through. But that track explosion is just... God damn, it's good. Yeah, so check it out. Um, Sign Language 2 Deluxe Version out now at the moment on all your regular streaming platforms. Okay, damn, sorry about that. I had a little bit of a technical difficulty. So if you're watching this, you'll probably see it go from a little bit, you know, uh, it's a little bit lighter in the background and my face is a little bit more well illuminated because I was recording it during the day. And then if you're watching it now, you'll see that it's a little darker, right? My face is a little bit more in a shade. Obviously, it's probably to do with my dark complexion in the first place. I just learned that on YouTube. Somebody left me a comment and said, oh, you're dark skin. I was like, wow, that took me by surprise. All this time, I thought I looked like Chris Brown. <gasps> so anyway, um, you, you, if you're watching, you should I'd notice a difference if you're listening you'll notice no difference because i'll snip the two bits of audio together and it'll be seamless absolutely seamless anyway as i was saying before i was rudely interrupted by my um, failing technology items that i have here i was talking about the fact that i think those palace guys are a bunch of wankers but there is one kid on the team that's fairly cool that's sean powers kid right that one of the first kids i think they signed outside of their little uk bum chum crew um you know he looks a little bit like a mexican or looks a little bit like a puerto rican fear vaughn if that makes any sense little t-rex arms little bulbous nose you know what i mean right um and this little video clip of him went viral um i, I don't think he was aware of it maybe he was who knows but he got in contact with a karen who stopped him from skateboarding in this little square pavilion looking place that looks pretty cool um i'm assuming it's a pretty cool spot nowadays especially with lockdown in new york being so draconian that no one's allowed to go out anywhere so it's probably the streets are probably free and you can probably skate around and i'm assuming new york police department people are probably not you know pulling up skaters and giving them tickets so it's a fairly good time to be a street skater over there in new york so this video went viral of him skating around in a little square i'm going to play it for you now and it just got me thinking about you know what kind of person a karen especially would be this disturbed about a guy just skating in a place that looks no bigger than you know half of a five side pitch it's like a tiny little area and there's legitimately nobody around and she's really really pissed off What's she doing? It's fun at this point. She's trying to hurt him. And every time he skates by, no homo, but no homo, but does, does this kid has his nipple pierced or something as well, or is he just really perky? But anyway, regardless, if you're just if you're just listening, the the clip is just this kid skating around a little pavilion. This Karen keeps trying to block him off, and at some point she tries to put her foot underneath the wheels in order to kind of trip him over, which is fairly insane. If you know how it is to fall off on skateboard when when you know, when you go over a little piece of a pebble or some rock or something, you know you could go flying. So for her to do that is pretty nuts. Um, but yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Funny that I was talking about the Palace guys the other day, and suddenly this little public freakout video would come along my way. Maybe it's the universe speaking to me. Who knows? Who the hell knows? Next on... No, oh, no, no. Actually, not next on the list. To, to, an update on this, actually. To continue. I'm, I'm going all over the place. I need to relax. The update is... Obviously, the Karen, I think, got her way in the end. Because I think she must have complained to her local whatever um, council. Because according to Court Snacks, that spot is now gone. It's finito after that little, uh, you know, Karen incident. So this is a picture of some workmen outside basically installing skate stoppers um, to basically prevent anybody from grinding on that little ledge. And then someone, I think, was saying in the comments, oh, what is that actually used for if it's not meant to be a skate spot? And from what I from what I know of these kind of urban developments and places, whatnot, whatever they may be, usually most of these little things that they put that are perfect for skaters to like, you know, grind on and do tricks on, whatever it may be, are usually a kind of um, a very sort of like 
uh, a very sort of aggressive way to make like anti-terrorism sort of installation-y structures, right? That's what basically they are. You know, when you sometimes go to some city centers and you see those massive flower pots that like come up to your shoulder. They're just insane, right? Who, who, why do a flower pot that big? They're usually just another way to just get massive bollards around a very key financial building so that if somebody crazy in some sicko ISIS merch rocks up and tries to drive his car up inside the foyer, they can't get through. That's usually what I've known for them to be. They're not usually things for us. It kind of is a, is a, is a kind of, um, you know, a benefit that they might kind of, you know, they might be used by humans on their lunch break to have a sandwich or some skaters, you know, with baggy jeans they might want to do a couple of cro crooked grinds on them, but they're not really meant for that. They're meant to stop, you know, the old Mujahideen from coming in and taking over from what I've known anyway, um, in terms of urban planning. But yeah, man, skate stoppers came in and just kind of snipped them all in and just did the damn job. I wonder if the builders actually feel bad for installing them because they know most of these places are kind of dead you know, prior to skaters basically arriving and doing their thing in that area, they're usually just a bit, you know, sterile kind of city centers, you know, whatever, or people go to lunch, whatever it may be. I wonder if they feel slightly bad or maybe they just don't care. You just do a job and keep it moving, I probably think, innit? I would imagine so. Probably keep your own doing your job, probably keep on doing your job. Next on the list, another topic that I won't speak about actually for ages. I had this on my list here. This is actually an article from March 8th. I was wondering, especially after watching that um, Tech House documentary on Resident Advisor, I recommend you do check it out. It's really good. Um, it's kind of, a, it's only a, is it 15 minute documentary? It's not that long. It should be a bit longer, maybe more in depth, but they do give a good, they do give a kind of good outlay in terms of the, you know, the lay of the land now with Tech House. It's kind of history, um, what it means now to this current generation, why it's so kind of riled in the scene and it's got a bit of a bad connotation. But definitely recommend you check it out. Anyway, on the on that point, it featured Jane Fitz and it got me thinking about Jane Fitz, right? One of our more prominent um, UK DJs here and, you know, somebody that's obviously very well respected within the female DJ scene as well, but in general, just a great DJ and somebody that's kind of well known in the scene especially if you've been to any of the um, World Unknown parties, you would have known, you would have seen her play a few times there um, alongside Andy Blake. But she was featured in this documentary and it got me thinking about some of the little titty tap, tip for tap that she had last year before the pandemic really kicked off, before the corona really kicked off with this woman. Which brings me on to this article here from Rolling Stones. So it says how this woman's collaborating to reimagine the future of community action if you're not familiar this woman is a sort of like a all female or all non-binary um dj collective producer group whatever it may be basically representing people that are mostly unrepresented within the electronic music space a fairly cool crew with one of the best logos that exists out there kind of a flip on the kind of old school uh discman and they've kind of flipped it to say disc woman so one of the best i think logo tees that exist if you don't want if you don't have a piece of their merch definitely go and check out some of their bits and bobs and they've got a really strong roster of DJs on there too that I'm a big fan of. But, and who's my favorite? I think my favorite probably might be Umfang. She might be my favorite on there. But anyway, regardless, right? They had a little bit of a tit for tat where uh, this woman early on in the lockdown basically put out a tweet if I remember it correctly, asking for help from the community, basically donations, right? Um, this was prior to anything actually being confirmed, I think. No, it was pretty early. It might have been about March, I think. That might have been the reason that everyone got their their kind of knickers and the twist but i remember the reaction to it was really odd at the time everyone kind of lost their marbles especially people in the scene i think it would have been okay if they got hate from like you know random people random just fans and customers whatever maybe i think that's fairly um you know normal for most of these people especially if you're a high caliber artist and you're always on social you're probably going to get a, 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 you know your fair share of trolling or whatever maybe that's fair enough but i think the actual concerning part was that there was loads of people loads of their peers you know fellow professionals in the scene that were kind of making some snide remarks sub tweets and whatnot maybe and one of the first people that jumped out the window was jane fitz right she came out the window and effectively said that the girls were jokes right for basically putting out that tweet and asking for help from the scene during a very unprecedented 
bad time and the thing no this is actually on facebook so this is the actual original screenshot somebody here uploaded the actual screenshot said the following from 13th of march it's very very early on in coronavirus times it says hey everyone everyone is drastically losing work and money at the moment which is absolutely devastating we're navigating a completely unknown territory with a government that has no compassion so turning to each other feels like the only option so fairly sincere a message right out to your community you'd guess right the whole like you know resident advisor save our scene if this is your scene you're like hey we provided you some good nights i'm hoping that you kind of you know love us as artists and love what we're doing if you want to continue helping us doing our work hey kind of contribute during this hard time so we can just you know keep um keep a roof over our heads just so we can hold uh, hold ourselves down until things get better you know whatever and it continues artists have lost thousands of dollars worth of shows if you're in a position again very sincere if you're in a position to help you can venmo whatever you can paypal whatever and sending so much love to everyone who is struggling right now and then jane fitz shared that on her main instagram page right and said that the following in the caption if ever there was a good reason to self-isolate it is to keep me far away from these disgusting entitled idiots now i think this was fairly over the top and obviously not what not warranted and not needed at all but maybe part of the reason why she went in so hard was because she might have had some prior experience with these girls before i don't think so because if you look at some of their i forgot who it was but there's a guest miss that they did with somebody i forgot her name it back something i forgot her name i don't know i listened to it ages ago but i remember there was like a guest mix with a guest mixed with one of the people signed to disc woman and they were saying something like oh who's your favorite dj and they mentioned jane fitz right so i don't think there was ever a beef but it seems like there must have something must have happened between then and now where she would come and out the window straight away so it got me thinking after seeing jane fitz in a tech house documentary and after rereading this article that came out in march does jane fitz oh this woman an apology considering everything that's gone on right with the world and concerning corona and concerning most governments of how they've treated you know most um you know creative arts and nightlife culture and hospitality and the things that's been going on with the play graves and all these very affluent djs flying off to like third world countries to go and dj and give back and all this sort of nonsense does jane fitz owe these guys an apologies especially if you consider jane fitz has played pretty much cons not consistently but jane fitz has played a few play graves over the entirety of this time that we've been in lockdown She's played a few and she's, and if I'm not mistaken, she's from the UK. So she's left a fairly hot country prior. You know, with vaccinations, we've kind of sorted things out pretty well. And she's flown all over the world to go and play, you know, at a pretty difficult time when, you know, it wasn't probably the most um, socially accepted thing to do. Might have been, you know, right to do by the rules because you're allowed to leave but ethically, morally, there might have been a bit of a question there. Does she owe this woman an apology? Because if you think about it, this woman compared to Jane Fitz are small fry, right? They're like independent. They're basically representing people who the scene has purposely tried to like ice out and not get them involved. Jane Fitz is basically the establishment and these guys are the outsiders. And then she's criticizing them for asking for help when she's in the position when the position that she's in she should probably be helping them in the first place she should be one of the first people leading the charge like hey support these girls they're doing things right they're kind of on their own they haven't got big backing they're not represented by wme and all that sort of nonsense they don't have a massive booking agent behind them or a co-sign or publications that are wanting to push them left right and center i really kind of know it's a but you know what i mean right that's how it should be but regardless let's look into the article because it kind of breaks down a little bit over here so this is from rolling stone it says the following let's get this to pause i hate these autoplay videos They're annoying let's continue it says the middle of march 2020 uh, stay at home precautions went into uh, went into place across the united states to help prevent the spread of coronavirus new york city based platform collective and booking agency my bad i, I'm, I think i misrepresented what they are this woman sent out a tweet asking for a donation on behalf of their roster last year was supposed to be agency's biggest year yeah a lot of people are saying this right last year was definitely a time it felt like especially for me being a fan and putting on parties and DJing in my own little place it did feel like stuff was really starting to hot up around 2019 it was starting to get really really tasty and then bang you know the universe said fuck off 
Right, <laughs> we continue. Uh, Disco Men uh, so, uh, was biggest year yet, with some of their artists preparing for their first European tours. But over 100 shows got cancelled within the span of just a few days. Disco Men exclusively represents women and non binary artists, most of whom are people of colour. The group's co founders, Emma Olsen, Frankie DeCazia Hutchinson, Christine McCarran Tran, knew that um, many of their artists would soon find themselves in dire financial situations as a result of the unexpected domino effect. Effect. Much of this, much to their surprise, however, the tweet ushered a wave of backlash from the industry at large. It's right, it's what I mean, the industry. Forget the fans; it's the industry that got them, which was, must have been really upsetting. It's one thing getting trolled by boiler room comments, but when your actual peers in the industry are the ones poking the fun at you and saying that you're a disgrace and you you should be self isolating because you're the ones that are cancer in the scene, that's got to hurt. Especially when you're representing people who are not represented in the largest, in the kind of general, you know, tech no dance music scene that must be annoying it continues some claim that their artists didn't deserve the money within the larger matrix of the need while others thought that this woman was attempting to spin a time of acute collective suffering into some sort of cash grab for the three co-founders it was a painful moment that could fundamentally reshape this woman's future now i've i've seen my fair share of grifters and i think you have too especially if you live on the internet like i do that post that i read out from them did not sound like a grifting post that sounded like a, the most sincere and um heartfelt message that you could put out especially during this time because you have to also imagine too most people don't enjoy sending out putting out messages asking for help from the local community it's not an easy thing to do it does take some level of um um it does it, it does it does require you to put your pride to one side and to put your arti not artistic integrity whatever it is you have to just put it to one side and just say hey i need your help at the moment and kind of hold your hand out and hope some people can drop a couple shekels in the center of your palm but this message i thought was pretty nice i thought it came across pretty well it kind of spoke about what they basically the situation they're basically in and basically asked hey if you're in a position to help please do if not cool but here's the thing and then you could of course share it yourself if you wanted to but i thought it was fairly sincere in my humble opinion it continues none of us were expecting that especially because it felt like we were very clear um that much of what we would do is based around community and helping others hutchison says from berlin just a few days shy of the one year anniversary of the tweet in that kind of moment you're focused you're forced sorry, to reflect on the industry you're part of and why we're giving so much in the industry that clearly doesn't care about us at all how much can you do how much can you do to deserve respect what do into what do marginalized artists need to do in order to be understood and valued in our industry and that's an important question because some people would say, especially about them, right? Some people would say, oh, if you're not represented, go out and do it on your own, right? So put on your own events, have your own DJ roster, have your own booking agency, represent your, whatever, right? And they've done half of the work. They've done maybe more than half of the work. And then the other half is just, you have to give them a chance, right? You have to kind of book some of their artists on some of the bigger stages, um, give them a slot on some of the biggest clubs, um, you know, uh, put them in contact with distribution things whatever you if it's actually about hey it's a level playing ground you just need to get going because that's the common argument you hear about people oh no you just need to start people are not they're not doing anything okay they've done it and then when they actually need some help you then go and take the piss out of them especially when there's people that are in a far more um affluent also from yeah they're in a far more financially secure position than them it's just insane con considering that we've all kind of been in the same position as well to start with it continues here in spite of the backlash of the tweet this woman um did some donation uh did get some donations after divvying up the money they were able to redistribute just a few hundred dollars after all of that just a few hundred dollars the community even come together for them it's just horrendous isn't it to each of their artists and stop gap to help them to get through the month but the hostility of their efforts shed light on something more sinister within the music world of dance music so many of the people engaging with the music don't want to talk about racism because they see it as separate olsen explains they purposely seek out dance music not to deal with this stuff and it's it's true similar same things happens with football no one really wants to talk about why they're you know why ryan mason got the flipping um interim manager job at spurs and not someone like a ledley king or i think chris power is the or carton power i think well i forgot which one it is one of them there's a few other black coaches at the moment there are spurs but they didn't get the job right and ryan mason did no one really wants to have that conversation because i guess people are just tired about talking about you know racism and diversity and inclusion because it just it just feels like such a big task to take on but sometimes i think to myself like it's such a 
it's such a shame that we don't kind of speak about it more often in dance music or we don't address the issues because if ever there was a space that you could really try to create some version of a utopian society or you could try to create something that you would like to see reflected in the real world i think it would be in dance music i think it would be in nightlife right you could do something like that because part of the reason why people go to these spaces and go out and get loose is to escape the rigors of their everyday life right so if if that's true and you've got this you know, you've got matriarchy patriarch gravity that exists within the real world when you go into club land you just want to shed yourself of it you just want to be in a space somewhere sharing the space with people from different walks of life different sexualities different racial connections whatever it may be right and you're all kind of celebrating under the guise or under the temple of techno and dance music that's what you really want to be about and the greatest thing for that the greatest you know treat for people that are dance going dance hall will be for the people in the dj booth to be you know as diverse as everyone else is around you on the dance floor that's the only thing that always upset me sometimes and that's why when i put on my parties and my raves i kind of went out of my way to kind of book people that not necessarily always go for like oh i'm just gonna book female djs because i think that's, that can get a little bit corny it was mostly about okay let's try and book people that aren't on everyone else's lineup and that was mostly because you know most of our parties were taking place on the strip which is like one long road in that connects basically shoreditch to basically you know the top of stoke newington and most of the people that played on that street on that strip were the same people so when i put on my parties with some friends or whatever we just went to freshen it up so it wasn't the same names on lineup so you'd push and you'd go out you'd kind of listen to people's soundclouds you'd go to random nights and try and get people involved just to kind of make this scene a little bit more just give it a little bit more life do you know what i mean instead of just the same people playing in the same place the same music it just gets fucking boring after a while and these girls and these guys and these people within this label this woman are doing that right they've they've, they've done the work you told them them, hey go do it yourself they've got done it themselves they've gathered a roster of people and now they want to have a little bit of inclusion and feel like they're part of the thing and then when they ask for help they get pelters and then they felt like they have they've been otherized when they are legitimately the small the quote-unquote um they are the david in this equation right and the industry is goliath right and they should be trying to help them out instead of trying to kind of you know throw stones at them but hey what can you do it continues it says since it's founded in 2014 just to get that bit this is a bit i want to talk about here uh yeah um at its core this woman's work has always been community oriented which is the precisely why the backlash that the tweet to our tweet last March was so difficult for them to stomach. They've donated thousands of dollars to organizations like the ACLU, they say the Lash Leadership Project over the years, and they've raised over $19,000 this past summer from mutual aid organizations, Equality for Flatbush through the third installment of Physical Sick, uh, Physically Sick, sorry, a fundraising compilation that they created in 2016 alongside New York DJ Physical Therapy. Hutchinson says that in some ways the protests and activism that arose out of the death of George Floyd vindicated their initial call for help it only gave a fuller picture to understanding the depths of the fucked upness of people trying to drag us asking for help and in turn all those people who tried to drag us needed help themselves hunter says boom very very true oh, it's hard to take satisfaction in that but i guess knowing them and position that they were in they were probably like haha motherfuckers it continues um it is because of this tendency that um, Holson thinks the future of this woman and the future of nightlife in general as much as more guarded place. She can't imagine playing to thousands of people in, in, in the cav cav cavernous 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 that's what what's wrong my my uh, pronunciation today cavernous european club at any point in the future even if things do start to open up more she says i feel like there'll be, there will be a return to the underground that maybe existed 10 years ago in new york where we would find yourself in a very small party sort of randomly she says it's been hard to motivate herself to dig for new music i definitely feel on that one when there's no party in the end of the tunnel she's been focusing her energy on more private pursuits like setting up a new studio space where she's carved out a small listening room room where she can casually play records with her friends and finding that this smaller scale community space means a lot more to me than trying to fly around the world every weekend um what you call it um you know it's interesting right because i'm the reason why i'm laughing is this bit here i feel like it's going to return to underground maybe it's in new york but in in london in the uk 
as I proved, as I said with another video I mentioned, actually, I'm going to upload it later, actually. There's another video I mentioned, but basically all the big clubs in London that are reopening have got basically lineups that look like, you know, any other festival you'd go to in Europe, full of DJs from from Holland, Belgium, you know, Berlin, we're all over the place. It's, it's a flipping joke. So the whole idea we had about, oh, lockdown's going to drive a lot of promoters to go a little bit more local and, you know, connect with the community and give a platform to up and coming DJs and artists, <laughs> pants over here in the uk maybe in new york it might be different i know the clubbing scene there is a little bit more um what you call it it's a little bit more diy there's a few more spaces there and bars and whatnot what not that are really being used in core cool, interesting space in cool interesting ways and whatnot and i'm pretty sure doesn't um doesn't what you call it doesn't frankie doesn't she do the what you call it event booking for one of those places i'm pretty sure i've got which one it was but anyway it doesn't matter in the end, the point remains. Do you think Jane Fitz owes this woman an apology? I say yes. I say yes. Considering what's going on, especially considering that she's playing plague raves, right? What's worse? Potentially, like, you know, causing the deaths of grandmothers all over the world for your, you know, two and a half hour set of whatever shit you're playing? Or these, you know, lovely ladies deciding to... Um, put out a rallying call to support people that are on their agency and on their roster during a really difficult time especially during the start of covid and just kind of asking hey if you can lend a hand and lend a couple of pennies that would be much appreciated i would de i definitely know which one is worse but i'd love to know your thoughts in the comments down below does jane fitz oh this call an apology smash y for yes and n for no in the comments and let me know and we'll go from there in it and we'll go from there but i i think she does i honestly think she does what else we've got to link on here let me double check and make sure the time is not going too fast it's not great to see okay cool so that's it let's move on we've spoken about this woman haven't we we've moved on there oh this is a cool one so this is an interesting one just in terms of an observation so um if you're not familiar if you're not aware there is this great party right called crossbreed that takes place all across the UK, started up by a guy called Kiwi, right? And it's a sex positive party, sort of like I'd imagine done it with the inspiration of places like, what, what's that place in Berlin? Kit Kat, right? Where essentially you go dressed up in some really kinky sex positive gear and you basically get to have a little bit of debauched fun with your friends and strangers um, under the temple of electronic dance music, right? So it's pretty, pretty sick. And I think it's really cool because they go really out of their way to have a real clear criteria. There's a very strict door policy. They have all the safety precautions that are needed indoors for you to feel safe. And you have to dress up, right? That's the part of it that I think really makes it special. And I think for people in the UK, having you know known how our club is seen, especially in parts of the debts of the CD debts of Soho and um uh, and all these other places right you know what the whole dress up sort of like bdsm after dark theme is like so when they when people do dress up here in the uk they really go extra and over the board especially because we're a little bit we can be a little we can be a little bit puritanical sometimes so when the lights go off people can get a bit crazy so i've always wanted to go right and i, I think i'm definitely going to go especially with this whole new regime that i'm on right so by the time that happens in september which is the one that they've come they've put on here which i've got here on the screen right can you see that uh, uh, uh. let's just get this off here let's make sure this is over there hopefully you can see the actual screen but when they yeah so when they come back again so they basically i've done some whole slew of dates crossbreed and they've got a new event, obviously, that they're doing, putting together with a place called Fawn, uh, Crossbreed with Kiwi and Citizen. Citizen, who I actually met actually a long time ago at a Love Fever party back in the day. Um, I took a couple of pictures of him, actually, when he was kind of, you know, coming through. I think that might have been... Was he signed to Alex Bradley's label? I don't know. But yeah, I met him a few a few years ago. So that's pretty cool to see him on the list. Anyway, they've got this... Crossbreed have got a party, sex positive party that they do. They put out there. It's really cool. It's kinky. People get dressed up. So it looks like a lot of fun. And I always went to go. And now they're, you know, putting on this event um, at the... What's it called? That Space 289 on the 3rd of September on a Friday, 11 till 5 a.m. So it's going to be a proper good one, right? And I always went to go. And they've done this interesting thing with this one going forward where they specifically decide i'm gonna get that picture out of the way so i don't wanna get taken out on youtube here but they specifically decided to cater this event to people from the bipoc bip no poc bipoc whatever that is um community and i'm curious to know what people actually feel about parties deciding 
to open up their tickets allocation specifically for a certain group of a certain demographic of people or a certain race of people or people that represent or people that kind of represent a certain way or people that have a certain sexual per, 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 persuasion you know what i mean right so this is this is the actual um text that accompanies the event it says we are so excited to be teaming up with the formidable four in london to throw a smaller party celebrating queer people of color so pretty clear in what they're want to do there tickets for this event will be application only and will be available to queer poc first um welcome to crossbreed summer of love citizen aka not nothing inc uh no no, no was it no nothing inc or non no inc whatever that is um will be joining kiwi and playing all night long um we will have a playroom and a wellness sanctuary leave your bigotry and prejudice at the door jump into the head in this playground that welcomes queer people of color sex positivity and kink tickets will be initially only available for bipos bipoc and poc to apply that's an email with your instagram handle and a few words about yourself and a picture we'll get back to you with a link to tickets and you can buy your up to four tickets and bring whoever you like crossbeat is a most is a music focused party is open to everyone who is respectful and accepting we operate a zero tolerance policy on homophobia racism prejudice and constant violations of any kind we have a strict dress code and failure to adhere will result in you being turned away at the door without a refund please read the party rules on our website which kind of states you know what you basically are not meant to do basically you have house rules which are pretty cool in terms of creating a safe space it says people of color are consistently fascized and are represented within the scene we are doing our best to combat this injustice prejudice sorry crossbreed prides itself on harm reduction and stands firm to create the safer spaces and community within the club culture our staff will be wearing high vis armbands and will be present around the venue and in the playroom feel free to approach them if you have any concerns at any point and if there are to keep uh, and, and they are there to keep you safe and make sure you have an unforgettable experience please check the venue's website for accessibility information so how would you feel if you saw that and you saw that they were purposely or they were actively trying to encourage people from a certain community to sign up for tickets first and making it priority for them and then of course if you are outside of that you could then come in a second round does that make you feel a way i don't think so personally i think unfortunately this is what has to be done um i think if you do want to have inclusion and diversity because i think I, I remember saying something similar to like when um when there was a few festivals that was saying oh we're gonna have lineups 50 50 we're gonna have yeah gendered lineups right well no we're gonna have our lineups be 50 50 so half women half men um i was of the thinking that that was pretty dumb because you know by and large i'd imagine you'll probably find a greater you'll probably be able to select from a bigger pool of guy djs than female djs just just the way it is what you actually should be doing is just trying to kind of mix it up a little bit you know that's what you have to do you don't have to make it 50 50 just mix it up don't just don't book the same woman try and book other women that don't get the chance to play on those kind of stages or on those kind of nights but <coughs> The unfortunate part of it is that when you're first doing it, it's just going to be clunky. It's always going to feel a little bit performative when you are first trying to make your lineups more inclusive and make them a bit more diverse. It's always going to feel very, very clunky because you're just going to chuck somebody in there. You're not going to give them any prep. You're not going to give the audience a chance to kind of get to know who they are. Um, they're going to be thrown to the deep end. They might sink. They might swim. Who knows? And then most of the time when that does happen, they sink those, you know, established um establishments decide to just oh we're going to move on and go back to what we know but what i like about this is that they've tried they've done obviously the, the usual way that they usually do where you kind of you know everyone's kind of allowed in but they've also seen that hey our events are maybe not as inclusive as we want them to be and we want to make sure that these people feel comfortable enough to come to our thing so here here's a party Per, per, here's a party we put together specifically to make people f like yourself feel comfortable and hopefully you have a great time and you evangelize about it and tell your friends because that's how i heard about crossbreed i heard it from somebody else somebody else went and then i've always had it back of my mind shit there's a party that looks like this like something i'd kind of go to if i went to berlin in london that's flipping cool and these guys really take what they do seriously like i said they've got a whole kind of sick website where they sell great bits of merch and you know sex gear and stuff like that. They're, they're really really cool they have a great instagram they take awesome pictures like it's just a sick little thing all put together it's really really amazing a lot of real caring it's not like again it's not like a party that i've ever put on where it's just you know in some abandoned building somewhere with a couple speakers in the corner they look like they really really take care of what they do so with that said 
I think it's pretty cool that they decided to do this. And again, Citizen, I have kind of bumped into him back in the day in the scene. Um, I managed to take a couple pictures with him or of him when he was DJing at Love Fever, one of my favorite parties back in the day that they used to throw in some random, in some abandoned warehouse spaces all across East London. So it should be a pretty decent night. But I wonder what my um, non-black uh, viewers think of this. Would you be annoyed if you saw this listing and you wanted to go, but you, you weren't allowed to get tickets first? It was kind of predominantly kind of catered towards people that look like myself or do you think this is a welcome change or something that should be maybe you know adopted by other places other establishments other kind of you know mainstream clubs and club nights let me know in the comments down below i love to know your thoughts and opinions regarding this move on move on move on what else we got here we got this weird news about Pasha opening a new nightclub in London. They're taking over some, you know, there was a really crappy, I think it was, was it Soho? Somewhere in central London called Cafe de Paris. And it was sort of like, from what I saw, it was, they was trying to make like, I don't know why clubs in central London are obsessed with Studio 54. They're obsessed with it, but they get nothing. Nothing of the essence of Studio 54 is kind of replicated in these spaces. It's just the glitz and the disco balls and the velvet ropes and the, uh, you know, and the, which, and the cabaret and the, whatever it may be called, right? That's all it is. But they're not really happening spaces. You don't really see people there in there that are cool. And if you watch the Studio 54 documentary anyway, you would know that Studio 54 really didn't have a long run anyway. They had like a very short short run and the short run there was only a very small time that was actually a fun place to go hang out after the fact it just turned into a bit of a headache and then it kind of got too big for its boots it, it abandoned its kind of roots people got annoyed by it and then it ended up crumbling and the owners fell out like it, it went to shit very quickly so this idea that all these clubs want to recreate what it was to be in studio 54 without ever trying to understand what actually went into it being an interesting space what made the people that went there want to go there the djs that played there, like i don't know it just it just seems like they just look at the pictures on google and just try and copy and paste it over but this passion thing might be a bit of a bit of a better fit considering the type of people consider the type of people that go out in central london maybe who knows but i would imagine a lot of the people that go to central a lot of the people that they'd want don't go central london anymore most of those people are going to shoreditch and liverpool street right that sort of like dc10 ib for crew are mostly within the kind of ec1 area they're not really in like central west london anymore from what i have understood i don't know maybe i'm wrong it's the article here from mix mag it says pasha is opening a new nightclub in london it says pasha group is opening a new club in london the legendary brand has bought one of the capital's oldest nightclubs cafe de paris which opened in 1920s and has remained in western since then but again it's been refurbed a million times it looks like shit it continues the venue closed in december due to the pandemic has now been bought by pasha which will run it into to a, which will run it as a branch of Lyo. It's cabaret restaurant concept. Okay, it's still the same shit then. Oh, yeah, yeah. Lyo is a permanent sign at Bifa and has been run as a pop up in London previous in 2019. Okay, maybe it's got experience there. Um, this is Pasha's first venue in London since its flagship UK nightclub closed in 2014. 13 years of parties. Wow. I wonder why it closed after 13 years. Pasha Nakab in London, I wonder. It's probably a, a very interesting story behind that. It continues. Nick McCabe, chief executive of Pasha, said Cafe de Paris has been an icon of West End since 1920, so it's a great privilege to be taking it into the next phase of life. We are delighted that, true to its roots, it will remain somewhere that people can come and experience entertainment, hospitality at its finest, and we can't wait to welcome people back. Yeah, it's going to be. A, a situation i wonder who's going to play there the dj lineup is going to be interesting to say the least i wonder if they're going to try and replicate what they have in ibiza where they'll use it as like a kind of uh training ground to like blood for new djs whether it'll be a rite of passage like if you want to get booked by the bigger kind of passion night passion ibiza group places you have to kind of go there and have that on your cv um whether it'll just be licensed no whether they'll just kind of um you know have freelance promoters just putting random nights on there whether it'll be in-house i'm really curious to know what they do there. i'm very very curious but yeah check that out if you're that way inclined if you're that way inclined next we've got a very interesting thing here from mix mag it said burning man are considering mandatory mandatory vaccinations for attendees this sounds like a very unburning man thing to do but it's also a stark reminder as to how quickly our world has changed and the kind of sacrifices people would have to make if they will if they kind of want to go if they want to have the no, if they want to have the opportunity to go back to the life that they've known previously to covid it's unfortunate that this is the situation that we're in but this is one of those 
odd places in time that we're in where like you're just going to have to decide what levels of privacy you're willing to give up in order for you to return to some semblance of normality that you had previous it's just what you're going to have to do you might not like it you might not want to do it but if you actually do want to go back to doing what you did in 2019 at scale you unfortunately might have to go get yourself jabbed up mate you might have to get yourself jabbed up so it's the following Bernie Man is considering whether to make it mandatory for attendees to have a coronavirus vaccine. Organisers had previously said a vaccine would be mandatory, but have since backtracked uh, following criticism from fans and festival and the misunderstanding of COVID-19 guidance in the Nevada as a New York, State, uh, New York Post reports. In a vlog earlier this month, Bernie Man CEO Marina Goddell wrongly said that Nevada, where the Bernie Man is held, requires attendees to large events to have a vaccine. Okay, in Nevada desert, right? The idea of the vaccine to enter the festival was also met with outrage from his audience especially when you consider you're going to be outdoors most of the people there are under the age of you know risk i would imagine right but i should, I should imagine there's still quite a lot of people that go there that are fairly older right i, I don't think it's just a young man or woman's game but still i would imagine a, a big majority of those people that go there are probably going to be um, not really down to have a vaccine it says the following vlog uh, if a following vlog um, to the Burning Man site saw Godot backtrack on a statement saying that she misspoke. She said, we are super aware of the concern and thank you for your feedback. And we are weighing the gravity of what, what that does. And we know that mandatory vaccines can challenge the concept of radical inclusion, of course. But at this point, we kind of looked at the 10 principles as kind of a body of work and civic responsibility weighs on there heavily. Very true. Health and safety of our gathering of people is the number one priority, period, straight up. So I actually requiring vaccines is the way we're leading with that health and safety plan so imagine if you want to go to burning man you might have to get a vaccine the one place where you thought you could escape the perils of everyday life is just another reflection of the world that we actually live in and these are the things these are the sacrifices that we're gonna have to make or decide we're willing to make if we want to go back to normal it continues um a decision on whether burning man will go ahead will be made at the end of the month and if it does attendees will be capped at sixty nine thousand, which is eleven thousand people fewer than usual and could drop further i would imagine a lot of people have still got their tickets from last what from like 2019 probably still with them um so that's going to be a guaranteed sellout regardless i'd imagine a smaller scale burning man will probably be a pretty decent you know space to be in um there'll be a lot more fun um imagine all this time being away from that kind of crew in your community will be great to see people in real life so there's a lot of pressure on people especially if you're anti-vax you're going to be in for a bit of a conundrum a bit of a um head scratcher in terms of what you want to do i'm sure what also might end up happening people also might see this as a as a kind of uh, a preempt as to why they should go out and maybe set up their own thing so it might actually birth an entirely new scene an entirely new kind of community of people doing other kind of offshoots of burning man because they're fed up of being told what to do man you know that kind of idea i think that might actually end up happening i think that might actually end up happening we also have here an updated look of the Travis Scott's a fragment Nike Air Jordan 1s so that are due to come out very, very soon. And I only featured them just because I was thinking, you know what? I'm kind of getting fed up of watching and just viewing all this stuff from afar and seeing all these amazing limited edition shoes that are due to come out, especially when I'm, no, more likely than not, I'm not going to be able to get my my hands on them myself. I'm just not going to be able to get them, especially not for retail. Um, they're going to be fairly difficult to get a hold of. I'm going to have to, you know, enter a raffle for the privilege to pay for these with my hard-earned money, which kind of goes against everything that I've grown up to know what a raffle is. You know, when you grew in school, you'd enter a raffle, you'd buy a bunch of tickets for a pound, and then you might win a TV, a computer console, a bike, stuff that's way that's worth way more than your ticket, right? That was my whole concept of about a raffle but now nowadays with sneaker culture they've redefined what a raffle means and raffle basically means you get a chance to buy something that you really want but more likely than not you're not going to get a chance to buy it it's flipping insane um, and most of these companies are using these raffles as an opportunity to just you know get loads of contacts on their email list and they can send you shitty newsletters about stupid stuff going on sale like it's just a whole bag of nonsense and i think these shoes have kind of triggered me 
if you can say the least, right? They're amazing, beautiful shoes, right? They kind of learned like updated um, fusion of the fragment uh, Jordan ones that I have, the black toed ones with the you know fragment logo on the back, and then they've kind of t imbued some of the um, learnings and key style motifs of the you know Travis Scott Jordan ones with the swoosh on the outside. It's kind of flipped the other way around, basically backwards, right? So it's a beautiful shoe, and then it's got the kind of sail or the kind of off white midsole. The top of the shoe looks like it's tumbled leather so after a period of time it'll look fucking beautiful and just kind of been worn in you've got here some print there on the midsole similar to other bits and pops you've seen from fragment design and the school of hiroshi fujiwara so they're a delightfully beautiful shoe objectively maybe one of the better jordans i've seen especially when you think that it's very rare that you see a jordan one mock-up especially with, no a jordan one mock-up with that level of like blocking usually they kind of go for the standard paneling where it's like the mud guard uh the back panel you know all one color and then the toe box another color you know what i mean the standard kind of way right everything kind of looks like a backboard sort of variation whereas this is like majority white on the outside and you've got this amazing sliver of blue on the inside you've also got the idea that i, I was thinking anyway that these will look actually pretty decent with loads of variations of different color laces because of that massive basically blank canvas you've got the white there in the middle so they're a really really amazing shoe and i'm sure there's going to be some great bits of you know gear and merch associated with them but it's just hard to get excited with these for these actually when you know you're just not going to get them right you know the only way you're going to get them is if you go and call up the old chinese factories right that's the only way you're going to actually get these shoes if you start representing rep fam but if you want to actually purchase them with your hard-earned bucks go to a place like i don't know foot patrol nike store good hood wh where whoever's going to end up selling these right um essence and whatever you're not going to get them and i don't even know how many entries these guys get per like look how beautiful that is look at that angle with the swoosh backwards stitched on the outside that looks fucking bad that looks sick that looks like something you'd wear day on a daily basis right they've got the little um tooling stamp here on the side like really 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 well done you've got this as well double logo on the back you know that these are going to go for a, when they slap these sort of things in there you know they're going to go for millions amounts of money in it they're going to go for a lot a lot of money maybe fat not millions definitely thousands but at the back of the hill so usually on the fragment jordan ones the the little fragment logos on the side here but instead on these ones they basically put them right at the back of the hill with um what you got travis scott's uh, cactus jack logo there too like they look absolutely beautiful right there's no denying it but again like i said it's hard to get excited for these things because am i ever going to get a pair for retail probably not probably not there's some more pictures of them as well like look how nice these look with the white blocking look at they've got these little they've got a label here on the side this is again is another these things are just going to increase the value right because it clearly says this is a fragment design collaboration it's got the cactus jack sign uh, logo there on the other shoe as well um it'd be cool if they had like the the tongue label on one says cactus but then the the stamp at the back of the hill says fragment that'd be pretty cool right flip it on either side but they look great like i said they're gonna look incredible with um different color laces especially because they've got the that entire white bit here um for the tongue and then of course this big uh blue toe box and of course most of the white bits on the side they look great once they're laced up but i don't know maybe it's just me what do you guys think do you do you get excited for shoes like this anymore when you know you can't buy them um or do you just put yourself through punishment like i do just enter as many raffles as you can and hope your card gets uh charged <laughs> one way shape or form either you end up with five five pairs of shoes that are all limited that you're going to be happy with or you end up with none and you get l after l after l email sometimes you don't even get an email to notify you lost that's what even hurts fair enough you don't always get the shoe but sometimes you don't even get emails to let you know you don't get a shoe you just it just goes into thin air it's like sending a job application sometimes it's just like whoo, it goes into deep space you don't hear anything back it's just annoying it really is but maybe it's just me maybe it's just me Moving on to some more sneaker news, Virgil Abloh has been tapped up by Nike for another batch of trainers to come out, right? They've done the 10, they've done, you know, all the other track and field stuff that associated with that as well. He's done other Jordans, like he's, they've just been rinsing and wringing that Virgil towel dry as they can. And you can't blame them anyway when you consider how how well the shoes do. I think, as I mentioned, I swear, who I mentioned it to? I forgot who I mentioned it to somebody, but... I mentioned, I think I mentioned somebody that the Virgil shoes he does for Nike, the, or the off-white and Nike shoes, 
they might be outside of Yeezys. They might be the most commonly worn. No, outside of Yeezys and Sakai's, they might be the most commonly wore, worn hype shoes or limited edition shoes I've ever seen in real life day to day. And again, I don't go to all the hipster places. I'm actually living in London. So when I go and walk around and I'm around town, I'm going to work and I'm back and forth, whatever I'm doing, right? I see a lot of people where they're wearing day to day and you see a lot of Dr. Martins, you see a lot of those massive mountaineering feelers that are flipping terrible, but save that brand. Um, you see loads of Air Force Ones. Um, you see a lot of Converse's, but in terms of limited edition shoes, you don't see a lot, right? But when you do see them, the ones you see actually people wear and they actually love them to death and you see them being battered up and worn and beaten are usually Yeezys. Um, any of the Sakai's, I've seen loads of girls and guys wearing them day to day. And then, like I said, off-whites, whether it's the Air Maxes, the Jordans, like you see people in Air Force One, people are wearing them day to day, which is pretty sick to see. So I get that these Dunk collaborations especially would be uh, very well received, but they're going to do 20, 20 shoes, bro, 20 models, actually, 20 models, right? 20 different models or 20 different colorways of the same model, right? Of the Dunk that he does with obviously the little, um, uh, what you got, climbing rope thing that he sprays all over the top of them. Um, and this is from Hypebeast. This is the following. Um, according to reports, we could be seeing a range of off-white Nike releases next this year. Nike leakers pirates have provided an image of a mock-up that is going to be the Nike 20. This is expected to be the latest in Virgil Abloh's ongoing partnership with Nike. So I guess is so I guess Nike did right by Virgil what they didn't do right with Kanye. They decided, hey, you are actually bringing in a coin. Your collaborations always do really well. Um, you take fresh approaches to like you know staple products that we want to keep selling week in week, uh, day in, year in, year out. Nike are desperate. To to make the dunk thing work i personally don't think it has i think they've pumped a lot of money into the dunks activations promotions marketing whatever it may be and it just hasn't taken off as it needs to be because by and large the dunk is just never has been well, well received i remember back in the day when i was at working at 1948 at nike and they had the whole be true to your school collaboration probably one of the best sneaker probably one of the best sort of like classic dunk um retro collab to come out during that whole nike sb period and they were beautiful right um all these sort of like college basketball colorways done in plush suede and levers really really well done i had about four pairs during that time and they they sat on the shelves for ages no one gave a crap about them they did a big promo push there was loads of hipsters wearing them and loads of really well-known people in london scene wearing them and doing adverts and shit and they didn't do well at all um they've tried time after time Whether, unless it's a dunk sb that everyone's just buying in order for it to accrue a certain value they're not really popular with everyday consumers i just don't know why it is i think because Air Force Ones are just so much a far superior shoe if you're looking for that kind of silhouette the Air Force Ones are just on a whole nother level why would you ever wear a Dunk and to be honest they're not the most comfortable shoe either they're not very comfortable that's something people don't really realise especially Dunk Lows they're very uncomfortable that little that little bit here you see this bit here whatever that bit that that bit that connects basically to the bottom of the tongue to the toe box it really eats away at you especially from my feet i'm not too sure if everyone else is the same but that's what happens to mine so it continues it says rumors are noting that the massive drop would see off-white and nike dunkler rendered in colorful takes that build on the contrast tone looks associated with the model continuing details include an exposed tongue traditional shoelaces marked lacing system paired with the trail like flywire cord laces um zip tie orange tabs and the industrial helvetica text printing it's interesting to note that virgil left a comment on pirates post to deny the mock-ups yeah virgil wasn't really that fond of the mock-ups and what they did essentially what pirates did is that they saw the the kind of color codes that existed for the model no the color codes for the shoe and then they basically did some mock-ups in photoshop to basically get an idea of what they would look like virgil looked at them and said nah that's i would never design something like that something like something like that he said words of those effect but you know looking at it from afar they look pretty decent now, i'm not going to lie in terms of colorway wise um maybe there's probably a little bit too many colors there you might want to slim it down to 10 in terms of actually you know um overkill but it's nike at the end of the day if nike, if anyone knows how to really flog a dead horse until it's absolutely you know dead dead it's nike so that's no surprise in that regard and then i think there was a colorway here i've actually got where is it there's actually yeah there's two actually colorways that have been actually seen in real life so i guess the mock-ups aren't that far off right there's a colorway here so i think this might be this one i'm not too sure 
maybe it's this sort of colorway in this colorway it's like a sail like a light blue with like a sail and like a gray swoosh it looks like with like a sky blue again on the outsole it kind of may be similar to this to this one here that's featured by just fresh kicks it says there'll be okay just fresh kicks give an update they said there'll be 50 different colorways with two different plates and like and laces and insoles so this is what they have and they have this really great colorway i like which is sort of like um a gray with white and then you've got the sail midsole here which really kind of pops off a little bit and then you've got these amazing fuchsia pink um laces that goes over the top of the shoe and it just works really really well these are really nice and then of course you've got this plate that basically says 30 out of 50 so i think that might be the 30th model out of the 50 which is a lot of shoes to be completely honest um maybe a, a bit too much in terms of selection obviously not a lot not a lot when it comes to Virgil building a legacy over there at Nike because imagine if he's able to sell out this entire collection or they all happen to be very coveted shoes not sell out let's say because the thing with the original 10 people don't actually remember is that some of the Air Maxes and some of the other kind of other you know not so popular basketball shoes they still sell for pretty much double retail sometimes three times as much as retail so they all eventually sold out you can't buy them in, in the shops anymore and they're still covetable right so that basically is a win especially if you're releasing 10 pairs of shoes it's all good you know selling out one pair maybe two maybe three maybe four but 10 is insane so if that happens as well with these that's going to be a real feather in his cap it's going to show that hey he knows what he's doing when it comes to collaborations and that's the funny thing as well i think you know especially when you look at some of the off-white shoes and the shoes he does for louis vuitton virgil's best work for sure when it comes to footwear is definitely collaborations 100 percent. i'd say clothing maybe i think his stuff is probably nicer than the stuff he's done collabs with but i think when it comes to footwear his collab stuff is like on another planet so if you're a footwear brand maybe because nike is such a fucking beast of a company they would probably uh in no way shape or form looking to help no looking to allow him to go and do shoes with any other especially athletic brand but if you are a footwear brand that isn't in the that isn't competing with nike you probably your best option would be to go collab with virgil as soon as possible because when it comes to footwear he kind of has the real um stardust quality in order to kind of lift you know really basic models that you have and take them to a whole another level because even this black colorway looks pretty sick the picture from hypebeast that they've taken or whoever this uh leaker is that took this picture is flipping horrendous you've got a kid here wearing cuffed pants with no socks it just looks terrible right he probably didn't even, didn't even moisturize his ankle it looks like but regardless the shoe itself and the makeup looks classic it's like classic um off-white sort of colorway mock-up it's not a classic nike actually mock-up that i've had in a pair of mx 90s where it's sort of like a black upper with like a silver swoosh and white laces very well done i think i had a pair yeah, i did i had a pair of mx one mx 90s and a, and a pair of air force ones in a similar sort of mock-up um sometimes you get a sort of like white midsole here with black outsole but the entire thing's been blacked out it looks pretty pretty epic to be honest i'm not sure why the the label or why the badge the little thing on this outside looks like it's been covered over with a marker looks like somebody went over it with a sharpie or something i'm not sure what that's about that might be tie in with the release you've got a little tab underneath the lace it underneath the swoosh but it looks fairly sick I'm not gonna lie um that wasn't in one of the mock-ups you know? so maybe virgil was right what he said about um the, the whatever we thought he was gonna make aren't on there because that black one isn't on there so maybe there are some other models that we're not aware of that are not on the list but still man nike dunk lows um a whole collection of them 20 according to virgil or 20 according to some people some people are saying 50 but regardless when they do come out you're probably not gonna be able to get a pair anyway so what does it matter really when it comes down to it but these pictures from hype pieces we need to do better sneaker pictures we need to do better because these pictures are absolutely garbage they don't really want me to buy them at all i can i cannot i can obviously envisage myself in them envision myself in them but these pictures are terrible the product ones are pretty nice but again they didn't relace the shoe but the actual shoot the actual ones with the kid wearing them with his feet inside look horrendous but the actual product shots are beautiful like look at that that looks sick isn't it that looks really really good get up on the screen that's not bro. come on work 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 get up on the screen this looks really good isn't it come on load what's it what's happening here oh it doesn't matter anyway you, you you get the drift let me know what you think in the comments if you like them or not will you get a pair for yourself i would like to know i would like to know